Hey there, Frequencies Open, and welcome to Enterprising Individuals, the Star Trek discussion podcast that boldly goes into excruciating detail about the series, characters, and stories of the Star Trek universe. I'm your host, Aaron Coker, a.k.a. Caliban, and I can't believe that Congress has once again failed to pass the Kidney Pills for All Act. Call your representatives, people. I'm joined once again on this episode by Asterios Kokonos. Asterios is a writer, comedian, and podcaster, and along with Sriracha, is the co-host of The Loudest Podcast, the loudest podcast on the internet. Asterios, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me back. Uh, do, wait, listeners have seen the title of this episode. <laughs> they, I hope do so. They know, do they know what movie we're talking about? They're going to know. We're, they're okay. they're going to know eventually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. Once the whale song, I play the whale song clips that I've got prepared. Oh, my God. We'll, we'll get to it. Uh, but it's good to have you back aboard. And today, we'll be talking about Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. I was, I, didn't, <laughs> I was so excited to say it, but I was like, I don't want to steal the host thunder. But yeah, we're talking <laughs> about the best Star Trek movie out of all of them. We will interrogate that uh, as we go on. But you do oh think it's God. the best one? Oh, I yeah, I definitely think so. Okay. Because okay. Interesting. you can just put it on and have a good Saturday afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I guess and you, you can, can have you can you can gather your nieces and nephews around the couch <laughs> and you can explain <laughs> why it's like I was showing it to my fiance and I was like, Yeah, this is why we say double dumbass. And she's like, We don't say <laughs> double dumbass. And I was like, Well, we did for a very brief amount of time. <laughs> but it was a really before. great time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is uh, yeah, this is before they had metro passes. You needed an exact change for the bus. I felt so bad for them. Oh my god. <laughs> Well, uh, by 1986, when this film came out, Star Trek was a well-established hit at the box office. And even though uh, Treks 1 through 3 may have wobbled in their critical reception, each film was a financial success, and the original Star franchise had successfully made the transition to the big screen from the small one. And the franchise's studio, Paramount, was now willing to let the series and its current creative voices, writer-producer Harv Bennett and director Leonard Nimoy, steer their own ship and take the series wherever they wanted, where they wanted to take it was into the past, or more accurately, the then present of 1980s San Francisco, where Kirk and crew would need to find an endangered species that could save Earth's future. In addition to the film's environmental message, Star Trek IV would showcase the comedic talents of its veteran ensemble, it would complete the unofficial trilogy of Treks 2 through 4, and it would inadvertently pave the path for the next generation of Trek storytelling. But we'll talk about that a little later in the show. First, uh, Asterios, it's always great to have you back on the show, and it's been a little while since we last talked. I think that we were talked uh, when the pandemic was kind of uh, in full swing or at least ramping up. And now that theoretically we are emerging from the worst of the pandemic, how are you holding up? Is your life going back to normal? Oh my God, my life never changed. I'm incredibly lucky. Like I got to work from home like a real son of a bitch. And like, and, and, all, and you know, and all these people on the internet are like, well, I haven't caught COVID yet. Well, I haven't caught COVID yet. It's like, yeah, because you're probably like me. You're like paid to hide behind your laptop all day, not right. like serve somebody food or groceries or something. Yeah. So Be in my hermetically sealed Brooklyn apartment. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh my God! I I will never complain again after what seeing other, see what other people went there. Because look, my life was depressing before the pandemic, so like that really didn't change. If so- if anything, it made me a little bit happier that everyone else was depressed. I was like, right. yeah, none of you guys are seeing your friends either, huh? But it's not due to crippling depression and anxiety. It's due to, well, I guess the crippling anxiety of getting killed by a global pandemic. Anyway, now we're all sad. Today right, right, we yeah. are all the stereos. <laughs> yeah, a crippling anxiety creates a lot of uh, brotherhood uh, amongst people. Sure does. Yeah, you're, I've got the Lotus podcast and I'm a big fan of it. Thank you. I love that it can embrace literally any subject, but something that you guys end up talking about a lot on the show is cryptocurrency. Currency. I've learned more you know, than I ever thought I would about crypto listening to a comedy podcast. What do you think is the end game for crypto? Is is it a fad? Is it going to become the new money? Is it part of a more sinister plot? Where is crypto going? Look, I hope it all goes away just because the, <laughs> the tears will be delicious. Like all the, <laughs> the worst people in the world got rich off this stuff. And yes, I am including my fiance when I say that. Like um, <laughs> all these people in their Telegram channels talking about get Elon Musk coin. They made like a coin that looks like Elon Musk. And I'm like, 
you're the first one to go. You're the first coin I want to bankrupt somebody. Um, I mean, it's I, it, I obviously there's clear parallels to the future where it's like, oh, there's credits, like there's credits in Star Trek. Right, right. Well, yeah. that, that, that got to run on something, right? Like they got digital money in the future, and then it's like, hmm, check out these like weird backwards. Uh, check out like these weird backwards Ferengi obsessed with the collection of fiat currency. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah, they're still using so money. Troll. We gotta get some. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But like that's so. It's always like it's always like Mm-mm-mm, the collection of latinum isn't cool. Yeah. Like even though, wait a minute, it kind of is. Let's really think about this for a second. Because when Morn spits up all that latinum, I am pretty happy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's where everybody keeps their latinum in the future, inside of their body. Yeah. Inside of Morn's body specifically. He's, he is the first, the more, the first Morn bank. Yeah. Yes, the first bank of Morn. I, look, if it, look, I think it's a hell of a lot safer to keep your, your money in Morn's belly than it is uh, in Coinbase. That's just yeah. a, a friendly tip from Uncle Asterios. I think so. Uh, I know that, of course, like any, I don't want to say scheme, we'll just say uh, initiative financially. Sure. The rich yeah. the rich people are the ones making money off of this. But like when this goes belly up, as a lot of us think that it will, what happens to everybody's investment in it? Like where does that money go? You take fiat currency or you take um, credit securities, you know, whatever it is you're using to buy the money, it goes somewhere to somebody else. And then you have value in something that, you know, fluctuates with the market but when the market crashes it's like uh, black friday right it's like everybody has nothing right all that wealth disappears oh no no there they'll be they'll certainly be value when all cryptocurrency dies all the people on twitter going like i'm ruined we'll see a whole new kind of uh we'll see a whole new uh, a meme called suicide talk where like they'll be jumping off the building and then it'll go backwards they'll jump back on they'll be jumping off um what was i gonna say look man i hate to say it i think this crypto thing is here to stay because people like you as crypto fans call us no coiners us no coiners oh my god we've been saying that this thing was gonna go belly up for like a decade now and i'm kind of like all right, maybe I'm the grandpa, but I'm very excited that uh, what what are those those digital pictures failed? What are those things called? The NFTs. NFTs. Yeah. 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 Did you see that thing where like the guy that bought the first tweet for two million dollars <laughs> had to sell it for thirty six hundred? Yeah. Yeah. Th- that was great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There a lot of uh, a lot of Schadenfreude there. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like ever since, you know, I mean, the Internet had changed everything. And, and of course, uh, you know, I was always wary of like PayPal when I was uh-huh. selling things on eBay back in the day. And I had to get like an Internet uh, bank or currency. And it's like, is this real money? And it, it skeeves me out a little bit that one of the guys that was, you know, there when PayPal started is one of the biggest proponents of crypto. So it's like it's just the same thing, isn't it? Remember when we had to like literally mail a check to like ING Orange Bank? So the, and mm-hmm. and like that's how we got money in our digital checking accounts. I remember yeah. the I remember the bad old days. Look, I'll say this. Well, I'll say this about NFTs. If every NFT were like a collectible Star Trek card with like a power rating, leadership rating, telepathy <laughs> skill, engineering yeah. skill, like if I could do something with this with these dumb drawings, now we're talking. <laughs> Or if they didn't look like garbage. But if they were Star Trek, then inherently they wouldn't look like garbage. They look great. Well, I've got good news for you. Paramount oh, has announced a new no. line of Star Trek NFT products. Are you, are you serious? Well, wow. I am serious. Wow. Uh, from the makers of the, the, heavy, the heavily environmentally messaged Star Trek IV comes uh, comes a waste of electricity like you've never seen yeah it's sad i was just recently at the uh the chicago convention and they had a big booth there for the uh i can't remember what it's called and i don't want to check it name check it anyway but for their nft initiative and like fans were not happy i don't know who this is for you know and people and and star trek like you said star trek people love collectibles they love uh, plates that you can't eat off of you'll get lead poisoning they love triple toys and everything and they were like Avoiding the NFT booth because they were like, no, we don't, we don't want this. Yeah, look, I, uh, I don't think it'll work. But wait a minute, I think I find the bright side. What if it meant Avery Brooks got like eleven dollars? Then I think it's <laughs> worth it. Like, yeah, okay, Avery Brooks, Sirach Lofton, um, 
wait, who else? Nana Visitor. If if you're if you're telling me if like even five percent of this goes to D Space Nine, let the planet go to hell. That was a pretty good TV show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I bet they'd agree on that as well. Uh, you Sidig mentioned Al your... Fidel. Wait, Alexander Sidig. Now what does he go by? Uh, it's still Sidig. Yeah, his 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 real name is is as long as your arm, but he, his stage name is uh, Alexander Sidig. Yeah. Okay. He Sidig deserves some money too. That guy. I love that guy. So cute. I don't disagree. What a, I don't what disagree. a dapper little gentleman. I'm sorry. You were saying something <laughs> far more important. <laughs> Well, it better be. You already mentioned your fiance. Congratulations on getting Thank engaged, by you. the way. Yes. And other than her uh, be fast becoming a crypto millionaire, uh, why she was this the right time to get engaged? She has so much goddamn. She has so much goddamn. She, what, a couple of weeks ago, she was like, oh, it turns out I have a crypto wallet that has, uh, uh, look, I won't say the amount of money, but she's like, Oh, somebody tweeted me, and they were like, hey, do you still have any of this coin? And I was like, oh, yeah, I do. And I looked it up, and it was, insert obscene amount of money here. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. And I was like, that's more Let's money than I have, period. <laughs> and you forgot it? She's like, yeah, I forgot I had this. It's like, it's like, so if you're wondering why now is the time to get married, because you combine your finances. You gotta lock One, that down. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> One big happy joint checking account. <laughs> oh, uh, no, joint look, crypto wallet. Look, yeah. Look, but in case she ever hears this, and she probably won't because it's about Star Trek. Like, um, I, I told her the only scene from this movie she had to watch was the one where Spock uh, uh, knocked out that guy in the bus. I was like, now you may go. She was like, thank you. <laughs> um, okay. but, uh, but what was it? It's a, Look, the tights. Oh, my gosh. The, the thing is, when you've got someone as funny and cool as this lady, there's always a, it's New York's a city of vultures and opportunists. I got to <laughs> stake the first claim. I'm like on the Oregon Trail to the capturing Sriracha Mountain. Gotta get it. <laughs> Gotta catch them all. Gotta catch them one. Okay. I think I covered. Yes. I think I covered nicely with that. Through sickness and in health, through death and dysentery. Yes. The Oregon Trail. <laughs> <laughs> through caulking or, through caulking or fording. <laughs> and the, yes, and the wagon has sunk, but we're still together. Uh, you also got a new job recently, and I you don't do. have to get too detailed about what it is, but is it I a creative won't. field? Oh my god, yeah, it's 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 more advertising -y stuff. Been in advertising sure. about fifteen years, writing TV commercials. You know the yeah. things that you fa that you try your best to avoid to ignore. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like you'll download like apps and like extensions, and you'll buy entire devices to avoid my <laughs> life's work. Yeah, that's what I do. Pay. Yeah. Hey, it pays the bills, yeah, not yeah. as well as going on 4chan, looking up what, looking up something called monkey sh coin and getting yeah. rich. But it's not bad. <laughs> it's just it's just, it's a, just a dishonest day's work in a different way. Uh, anybody who's a creative or who's in business for themselves can know how difficult it is to uh, do what they do, you know, for a quote unquote day job, but also do it, you know, on their own. And do you find as a person that it's when you're creating, you know, for work and you're creating, you know, at home or for your own um, initiatives, that it's a different kind of creativity? Or do you find yourself sometimes thinking, I spent eight hours coming up with clever things. Now I have to come up with like another you know, four or five hours of clever things. It's just oh. a lot. Well, I've got good news for you. Advertising is not about coming up with clever things. Oh, good. If, I'm it's not about... sure if you've ever seen advertising, but it's not really the go-to medium. I've seen for... Mad Men. <laughs> but, Don oh, Draper's so clever. Don't start with me about Mad Men, because here's the thing. <laughs> oh, Don Draper talks a good game. And then you watch the Burger Town commercial and it's terrible. Or it's like a girl singing about, what was it? It's a girl singing about diet soda. And it's like, this and is It is good. ripped off by Bye Birdie. Yeah. Right. And it's, and it's like, it's a, it's like, that's not good. And like all you, no, no I, can you name one good commercial they made? The, well, the Coke, if you count the Coke one at the end, Wait, I mean, that was but I see, I don't think you should count that one because they didn't write that ad. Yeah, <laughs> the that's thing true. Is, yeah. That's a real life ad that they wrote. That's it was true. A, they were a gray. But that defeats your purpose, though, because an advertiser did come up with that. And it's maybe it's just the best out of the worst. I'm just I'm just saying they spend a lot of time talking about advertising on Mad Men. Very little time showing it. Oh, 
Remember the thing where, like, John Draper was like, what if a gorilla jumped on top of the Samsonite briefcase? <laughs> and, like, it took him, like, all night and a huge fight with, like, his mentee, like, right. with, like, yeah. the young woman yeah. whose career he's shepherding to come up with the yeah. idea of, like, a real tough briefcase that won a boxing match. Yeah, yeah. What if what a meatball, fuck? but spicy? Yeah, right. Yes! Exactly. It's terrible. Remember when they were like, what if we made people fight over a ham? It's like, you guys thought of that? You thought of ham fighting? <laughs> I don't remember the ham fighting one. I'll take your word for there it. There was a whole thing where, they, where it was like, ooh, it turns out that Peggy invented PR stunts. And it's like, I'm pretty sure people have been fighting over a ham for all of humanity. <laughs> humanity can be summed up into th two old women fighting over a ham. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Peggy was an interesting character. I can't believe we're talking about Mad Men. We'll get to Star Trek I'll eventually. I'll talk about uh, it. About how she uh, she invented ham fighting, and then also, like, she tried a jazz cigarette, and then suddenly she had, like, a uh, connection to a whole new realm of advertising. Yeah, every time I, every time I smoked weed to try to come up with ideas, I just ordered a bunch of milkshakes to be delivered on Uber Eats, <laughs> and then I fell asleep covered in milkshakes. <laughs> Maybe the weed was better back then. I don't know. That might know. be a commercial for weed, though. Yeah. I don't know. Or milkshakes. Zach, like, wait a minute. Or, frankly, for milkshakes. Or for lactate. CBD lactate-y. infused shakes. <laughs> it, wait, they're called shake shakes. You know, shake that stuff oh, at the bottom of your you grinder. And then, and who, who is the person who endorsed them? That's right. The Iron Shake. The Iron oh, okay. Shake becomes the Iron Shake. And he's like, you drink the milkshake, make you humble. And now you see why I have plenty of time to be creative in comedy. Because this, what you just witnessed, listeners, was advertising. We're going to pass, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Wait a minute, call from Snoop Dogg, line two. Hold on. Wait, oh, oh, oh. NFTs, you say? How many, can I, how many can we sell? How fast? I know I just talked a bunch of shit about them, but all right. Shake, shake, <laughs> and Snoop Dogg, shake, shake, NFTs. Let's do this. As a comedian, do you find that people try out jokes on you or run things by you? Not like your your colleagues in comedy, but just like civilians? Oh, thank God, no. Because why would someone want to tell a joke? It's, it's very embarrassing. If it doesn't I, work, yeah. it feels like death. And even if it does yeah. work, someone's just going to go, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. We only, I mean, it's with Star Trek Four, these jokes work, man. All these jokes work. You know why? I like these characters. I right. like what they're up to. I like them running around in San Francisco. Like, uh, if, if, the, if this cast wasn't super duper likable, like, what was it? I think it was, uh, it was Norm MacDonald was like, uh, he tried his best to become a, a, a cast member on SNL. And he tried his hardest to be funny, and then Chris and then Chris Farley came in immediately after him and just like started riffing a bunch of shit, and it was the funniest thing ever. And <laughs> and and he was like, and Norm Macdonald was like, that's when I realized you hire someone like me to write jokes for someone who people already like in the first place. Right. Yeah. Chris yeah. Farley. Yeah. My my uh, my dad retired recently and oh. his whole life he had always liked comedy, but he knew that he had to like be a good father, you know, not a comedian and uh, and raise us. And now that he's retired, he's trying out he's actually trying out like stand up sets and he's doing uh, writing material and going up on stage. And this is for like, you know, like church audiences. These are like friendly audiences. But he, I'm the only semi-funny person that he really knows. And so he tries his material out on me. And I'm like, oh, boy, um, I don't know what to tell you. This kind of, like, crosses the line of our sort of relationship, doesn't it? Like, I can't shoot down your jokes. But I told him, like, you know, like you said, like, get ready to, for people to not laugh. Like, have more jokes about what to do when people don't laugh than, than your, like, your A material when they do because you're going to find yourself like trying to get out of situations where people are like, "No, we didn't. We didn't get that one. We're seniors in a in a retirement home." Your father is the bravest person I've ever heard in my life. Okay, well, I'll tell that's, you said that. <laughs> that's incredible. That there's a guy like in his 60s, I assume, or 70s, who's yeah. like, "Now is the time for me to get in, to get into stand-up comedy." That's his retirement. Yeah, that's him relaxing. He's <laughs> going up in front of people for the first time in his life. I gotta say. Don't Look, get too excited. It's a lot of Biden material. 
That's fine. Biden sucks. Oh, okay. Everyone sucks. Oh, Have no, you yeah, heard? No, yeah. Our politicians are clowns. But I can write a good joke about Biden, not just well, like Biden is the punchline. Maybe you got to wait. No, no. Know your audience. Have you seen those hilarious stickers at certain gas stations? Which one? I've seen a lot of stickers at gas stations. And the ones that maybe feature a certain Joseph Robinette Biden taking credit for a certain gas crisis. Yeah. Okay, look, you may not know the stickers, and this is that something that you're going to have to explain to your dad. Lesson number one, not everyone's seen those stickers. I, yeah. I'm telling you, man, if you get your dad, I think your dad could be genuinely hysterically funny starting out in comedy with a wealth of experience like having raised like several kids who have grown to be failures i assume you have brothers and sisters who are also sure. failures like um i mean he's just got he's got so much to talk about like you see like a 19 year old get up on stage and they talk about how like their dick stinks sometimes and it's like right. well <laughs> dicks do stink sometimes but i already knew that i don't need sure, you to yeah. be telling me that on a tuesday night at a coffee <laughs> right. shop yeah yeah. What else you got there? <laughs> Where's the specificity? Yeah, yeah. yeah great. Exa- now exactly. Now I have to feed. Now I have to feed my life to my dad for his act. Okay, I'll get right on that. <laughs> he's, he's lived a life. Wait, what did this guy do for a living? And without getting too specific, uh, he was in sales for most of his professional career. But before that, he did a million different things, like a real, you know, uh, laundry list of kind of like odd jobs. You tell your dad this. You tell your job that it is, it is literally his task to sell these jokes on stage. I yeah. think because it's like – because when you're selling something, you know it's terrible. I mean, if it wasn't terrible, they wouldn't need a guy like your dad to sell it. That's why they hire people like me to write commercials. Nobody writes commercials for – For a uh, for good product, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, cheap. Cheap, like affordable water, uh, like Rite Aid brand, seventy nine cent a gallon water. That stuff sells itself, man. Milk right. sells itself. I mean, it used to. Almond milk sells itself. Well, there's right. a lot yeah. of almond yeah. milk ads. <laughs> Not dairy Look, milk. Let yeah. me get away from this. Let me get. Let me veer us back on track. You tell your dad that he's got to go up on that stage, knowing that he's probably got a shitty product but he's got to find a way to sell it to this audience. And I bet that will put him in the place where he does well, when he divorces himself from the material. All right. One one salesman to another. Okay. Clearly your dad knows how to sell stuff. If it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have that that microphone you're talking into. You wouldn't have watched all who Who (laughs) bought your ticket to Star Trek four back in 1986? Was it with your paper route money or your dad's sales cash? Yeah, probably the second one. Oh, you didn't have a paper route? No, I didn't have a paper. I worked at McDonald's. That was my first job. Okay, that's much harder than a paper route. I tried to get a paper route. They were like, they were like, no, we just have a guy in a van do that. Kids don't, <laughs> kids don't deliver papers anymore. And I was like, God damn it, I was born in the wrong decade. <laughs> yeah, so go back to 1950. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally, they pointed at the van. They were like. They're like, that's the van. A guy goes around at five in the morning. It's, we found it's much faster to do this via van. <laughs> I think I've seen that van at the local playground, but okay. Yeah, look, you know, he look, he's got time in the afternoons. All his papers are done. <laughs> yeah, he gets off early. Yeah, right. Let him relax. <laughs> I've uh, I've really enjoyed watching some of the college lectures that you've done on Star Trek episodes and their themes. And of course, Star Trek Four has this theme of environmentalism, uh, which is a little slight. Uh, it was really important in the '80s. Of course, it's important in a different way now. Uh, of all the other Star Trek films, which one would have the strongest topic that you think you could dig into in a lecture setting, or have you talked about a film in a lecture setting? Oh my goodness! I got to give another one of those lectures soon. I a a, a buddy of mine. He just likes comedians, and so he has me come in every once in a while to his co- to his college philosophy classes to discuss mm-hmm. like the philosophy and morality of comedy itself, and um <laughs> and like you know and so like one time I came in and I just played a bunch of sketches like I played this comedy sketch of Stephen Colbert doing a very offensive Asian American accent okay. <laughs> like uh, um and uh, and and I was like and I was like all right. I mean, what do we all think of this? A lot of people were like, that was hilarious. And I was like, ah, yes, I failed. I failed as a teacher. I failed as a man. I probably shouldn't have brought in something this funny. Like, um, but uh, well, what was it? Yeah, but then sometimes I'll bring in like science fiction clips too and things like that. I would say that I think, 
I mean, I guess the most interesting, from an academic perspective, Star Trek movie would probably be Nemesis because you can talk about nature or nurture. Now, mm. the most interesting Star Trek movie is not Nemesis. I think yeah. Nemesis might be the only Star Trek movie that I, like, hate. You just hate it. I think it's, like, Nemesis I hate, and then I second I hate Kelvin Star Trek 2, which is just yeah, Kelvin Star Trek 1 again. Yeah, yeah. And then it's, it's like, and you guys wasted Sherlock. You had Sherlock, and you blew it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, you had a dragon. You had it in your in your hands. You had uh, that's, and, and like, Star Trek, it's funny because like that's a great point about Star Trek Ten, and that theme is like repeated or uh, two, three times. You know, you've got Shinzon's nature, you've got the Riemann's nature, you've got like before and Data. Like, would you know if Data was not brought up? Uh, on the Enterprise or, or the way that he was, you know, would he be like before? Like they, that is a persistent and prevalent theme in there, but man, they just kind of miss all the, all the hits on that. Yeah. It's like, what if B4 knew how to whistle as good as Data? Cause remember when he whistles, it sounds <laughs> right. like ass. It's like, yeah. you're a fucking robot. What do you, you can't just eat the isolinear chip that got whistling in it. We were whistling right. Dixie <laughs> since Dixie, which was five centuries ago for you before. <laughs> yes. Right. Oh my God! <laughs> but that... it's so specific. How, who? How do you program? Uh, you know, lungs, android lungs, inflate, deflate, blow through mouth. You know, aperture of mouth change. Like that's got to be very specific. What I want to know is if data is fully functional and programmed in multiple techniques. Oh, yeah. Like was Doctor Soon like really mm. laying pipe here? Like who put those in to the to the program? Well, listen, there are several documentaries that I watch frequently late at night. I'm just I'm a fiend for these documentaries. Have you heard of them? Are are they from uh, Brazzer Films Limited? Oh, you oh y yes, owned by the Janus Film Collective. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, I have a, a subscription to the uh, Criterion Online the Criterion Collections uh, app. And it lets me see all the Brazzers goodness I can do. Look, <laughs> bottom line is, just have them. D didn't Mae West teach a dude to whistle? Doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. True. And to, and if there's one thing Star Trek loves, it's old timey bullshit that the writer's parents watched, like Gilbert yeah, and especially Sullivan if it's operettas. A film. Yeah. Oh my God! If the yeah. if the rights are affordable, uh, I think I should point out before we move on, we don't want to get letters. But Mae West was a Paramount player back in the day. She was a big star at Paramount, but it was actually Lauren Bacall that uh, teaches Humphrey Bogart to whistle in the Warner movie to have and have not. Look, I don't care. I don't care what studio made it. <laughs> That's one of my favorite documentaries. <laughs> very, very informative. Oh, by the way, you can give that joke to your dad if you want. Yeah, okay. I think, I think he might be interested in it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when I got in touch with you and told you that we are talking about the films of Star Trek on the show this year, I suggested that we could talk about Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, uh, a film that for a long time was the highest grossing uh, Trek film, but it's also a film that, at least at the time, was unlike anything that we've seen from Trek at the movies. You know, there's no shooting, there's no deaths, no explosions, and it's essentially a comedy film throughout, or at least a lighthearted adventure. Do you think that Voyage Home stands up uh, with the other classic 80s sci-fi comedies like Back to the Future, or Weird Science, or Ghostbusters? Yeah, isn't it interesting? Like, we don't... It's like we forgot how to do those. Yeah. Or we stopped caring. Yeah. Like, I mean, what was kind of like the... Li like, all right, take the sci-fi element out of it. Like, what was like the last lighthearted adventure series that we all liked? Uh, what was that one where Nicolas Cage had to steal the Constitution? <laughs> yep, the Natural Treasure, Yeah. It's like we People like, like those. those Jumanji movies. Yeah, I guess. I, yeah, I guess. There's just so many of them now. Like, yeah. um, I mean, you know, I, I, I got to say, though, I, what you were saying about there's not a lot of shooting. I was, I was watching and I was like, you know, they only fire a phaser one time in this entire movie and it's to lock a door. Right. Isn't that cool? Like, they made yeah. a whole Star Trek movie. Without, with, without like the laser, without like the laser guns, nobody gets stunned. I mean, I guess somebody gets Vulcan nerve pinched, but that guy really had it coming. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
yeah, that was a that was a goal, you know, by Nimoy uh, in putting the movie together is that he wanted it to be lighter hearted. You know, the last two films were successful, but they were all about death and being stabbed and, and revenge and, and murder. And he wanted it to be lighter. And that sort of transitioned itself into, along with the writing uh, by Meyer in the middle portion of the film, into being kind of an out and out comedy. Um, although it is a comedy movie that starts with a dedication to the deceased challenger astronauts. So you're, you're starting in a hole comedically. Yeah. I was, I was like shocked by that. Yeah. And like, um, like, like I, I totally forgot that that's how the, mo- okay, look in my mind. Cause I only remember watching this movie from w- when I was a kid in my yeah. mind, scene two is them orbiting a star. Like in my, in my like, I guess I just always fast forwarded the VHS tape, or I always just tuned in on at HBO at the right time. But like, yeah, there's a whole half hour of like what you expect out of '80s sci-fi, like weird people with like weird facial hair sitting around in rooms with like glowy lights, going like jib jub with ninety four plexons worth of glue <laughs> like, right. like the like there's um what's the what's the name of the of the first starship we see uh the Saratoga yeah like there's that like dude with like the weird Fu Manchu on the Saratoga yeah when yeah. we get to Earth there's like two like weird half robot twins death punk guys yeah right yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Catman and yeah yeah. It's it's so interesting because it's like that's the part of 80s science fiction that like I cringe at like all the scenes in Return of the Jedi that take place like in Mon Mothma's war room. <laughs> it's just like a right. bunch of like goofy. No- I don't know why you put a bunch of dumb looking aliens in a bar. I'm into it. You put oh, a bunch yeah. of dumb looking aliens in like a space office and I'm like, now nah, you're losing me. <laughs> they have to be a little more relaxed uh, at the bar or somewhere else. I mean, um, since it's all the smoke that can hide their dumb latex Yeah, forehead. it makes the, the makeup look better. Yeah. It's funny, too, because all of those scenes that you're talking about are all housekeeping from a story perspective. Because this is like... Yes. You have... All these crazy things happened in the last two films, and you have to kind of like pay homage to that and and explain, yeah, yeah, we know about that. But then the the bulk of the movie is just them cruising around on modern day sets, you know, with actors who are just wearing cardigan sweaters or something like that. And then at the very end, we go back and go, oh, no, yeah, we got to pick up on this. And there's Daft Punk and Cat Guy and everything. Um, But yeah, they, they, they get a bunch of it in at the beginning and end and then jettison it to just go shoot on the streets of San Francisco. Which I love. And I mean, like... Nobody's favorite scenes from Star Trek Four are the scenes where they're judging how much clouds Earth has left. Um, right. Oh, yeah. I will say, just uh, I before we leave the first half hour, of this too too fast. Number one, is this the only time we've seen the entire planet go to red alert? That was pretty cool. Planetary right? red alert. Yeah, yeah. Earth yeah. went to red. Look, I don't know why Earth wasn't at red alert. I mean. As soon as all the starships started going dead, it's it's like, I think we've graduated from yellow alert status. And, like, I also don't know why it takes Sarek to tell the president of Earth, like, uh, you might want to send a distress signal. Yeah, the the planet (laughs) distress call. Yeah. Seems like we're kind of fucked here. But, I mean, like, the Spocks, or I don't know what their last name is. Let's just call them, like, the Spock family. Like, I guess once again, like, this movie proves that, like, those Spocks are pretty smart, huh? Only one Spock figured (laughs) out the whale thing. Yeah. This guy says we should pull the red alert. Okay, I guess. Uh, It's funny, too, that the planetary distress call isn't like, hey, help us. We need help like it would be on a ship. It's more we are in distress. Stay away from Earth. Bad things are happening on Earth. We might not be around later. So we're, we're, we're communicating distress in order to protect people who might come to Earth. Yeah, which is like a pretty brave move. Like it yeah. like it kind of it like. It makes you because usually when there's like a planetary governor, he sucks. He's yeah, like a real yeah, like yeah. he's like he's either like a straight up fascist or he's like a weasel or a weenie. And it's like eh, it's pretty kind of cool if this guy's like, look, 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 we're f- try not to get too close to us or you'll get hit with this weird f- ray, which again I've seen in certain documentary films. <laughs> oh my God, um, oh, great. but uh, keeping all this in. <laughs> but uh, but what was I going to say? But here's how smart Spock is. He finds a way to make the Klingon computer pull up all of Earth's sea creatures. You see yeah. that? Sh- yeah. 
I know. And, I know. and <laughs> not only that, they get the whale sound, but then uh, Uhura is able to like chop and screw it down into what it's yeah. supposed to sound like. Like, do they have like uh, Adobe Audition on the Klingon <laughs> ship or something like that? They can't no, export I... it. It's just the trial version. <laughs> We're sorry, Captain. All we have is Audacity. <laughs> but I've used these homebrew plugins nicely. This is okay. Is this the most helpful Uhura has been from a communications perspective? It's a big Maybe start for her. Yeah. In the whole show. Now look, Uhura's yeah. done a lot of other cool stuff. Like Uhura like helped uh helped them beat the 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 bad guy alternate reality Nazis. Like right. Uhura was over there too, knocking people out with the back of her fist and stuff like that. But like um but, I mean, as a communications, this is textbook communication she's doing, Aaron. Right. It's a signal. Yeah. But it's like a weird, oh, it's a weird signal that's killing everybody. And she's like, mm, 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 uh-huh, uh-huh. So, uh, look, she uses, like, the Klingon computer to simulate how much, wa- what it would sound like underwater on Earth. Yeah, I don't have that plugin. Yeah, I don't have I, if, if that plugin's around and someone can wears it for me because I'm not spending the eight dollars. Look, I get right. it. You worked hard on your plugin. I, I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> you got eight, so do I. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, like I know that they like have that throwaway line early on where they're like, "We've even linked this Klingon vessel to the to Starfleet's computers," but it's like, yeah. Well, at this point, all of Starfleet's computers are are a blue screen of deathing. Right. Yeah. 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 She's very useful in this. She's she's got that scene in Star Trek six where she's uh, pretty useful. She also kind of helps uh, track down the assassins on board the Enterprise in six. And then, of course, she's got the fan dance in number five. So that's super important. Well, Tachi, this is the I'm, but you'll notice, Aaron, I much like much like Uhura would uh, Uhura would specifically modulate a frequency. I specifically modulated my question to the field of communications. <laughs> <laughs> Because, <laughs> yeah, she does a lot of other stuff. It's just like a regular action hero. But this, this she put that little earpiece to use That's in true. this one. God I damn. wonder if the Klingon earpiece has, like, hooks in it or something like that, or if she can pair her own, like, Bluetooth to the Klingon ship. I bet it does. I bet, like, every time she does a good job, it stabs her right. so she doesn't she get too miserable. complacent. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we reward you with pain. <laughs> good job. <laughs> something I've been exploring on the show recently is uh, this idea, this assertion that I have that, like, Star Trek often isn't all that funny, and maybe it can't really be all that funny you know voyage home is far and away the exception to that rule but for the majority of the franchise you know the material is by necessity played pretty straight but when there are comedy bits they're kind of you know lame bits that are shoehorned in between the action and the few big comedic swings of of modern trek episodes like cupid or any q episode or or the naked now or anything involving luxana troy they all fall kind of flat i think that i mean i definitely I mean, it, that's the that's kind of the issue with like with with comedy. It's that like it's not. It's like like I like I don't know. I feel like it's a lot easier to get consensus on that action sequence is cool, or yeah. I sure hope the Borg Queen don't take over Earth. Yeah. Then like it's pretty funny that uh, <laughs> that Troy's mom keeps showing up naked. <laughs> like, <laughs> <That's> um, <funny. laughs> I will say though. A comedy sequence in Star Trek that I never get hear, heard talk about and I love is in Star Trek Discovery Season 1 where, um, what's his name, from where Harry Mudd uh, just keeps killing uh, that captain over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah. He like teleports him into space, he like blows his head up with a phaser, like stabs him with a Klingon sword, it's like... They ma- they made a way to find fa- they like found a way to make murdering a guy real funny. <laughs> yeah. It's like I'm impressed, yeah. guys. It's a light and breezy sequence of multiple murders. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean that's the only funny episode of that season because like remember every other episode is like a space tiger killed someone. Yeah, it's yeah they're definitely dealing with a lot uh, on that show. I'm trying to think of all the funny parts of Discovery season one. There was the part where. Uh, where uh, where she had to stab that guy in the turbo lift. <laughs> there was uh, <laughs> there was there was the part where we saw a guy get tortured in the worst possible way by a Klingon, and then we saw her nipple, and it's like, what are you trying to? What do you want me to feel here, Star Trek? <laughs> Why are you showing me this? I'm confused. I get you're excited that you're on Discovery. I get, I get that you're excited that you're on Paramount Plus or whatever, but it's like, 
Let me put that nipple away just for this sequence. Somebody, dozens of people became lifelong Star Trek fans when that happened. Yeah, look, again, much like comedy, it's not for, <laughs> certain things aren't for everyone, but if they're for you, yeah. you love them. <laughs> I, but, no, what were you going to well, say, I, though? Let's get away from the, yeah. I think that they know that they need to inject humor. You know, like when you think about TOS, um, the people that wrote that show, it's a sci-fi show, but they were, last week they were writing a cowboy show or they were writing a, a period drama or something. And like that old school scripting of 33% comedy, 33% action or intrigue and 33% romance, like it was always there. And I think that that exists in the modern franchise, but it doesn't, I don't think that they think about it a lot or, or they have it and it's like, that probably works. And it's like, you guys could have road tested this a little. Um they they have the character of Neelix, for instance. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate characters who are clearly put into the show to be the funny character. But mm-hmm. conversely, I do often find Neelix funny because, one, Ethan Phillips is so good in the part and he's so committed to the role. And also, I think there's kind of a meta element to Neelix because he kind of knows that he's – he knows he's supposed to be the funny guy, but he also often has, like, a lot going on and he has to be funny, like, yes. in spite of that. So we get a tears of, tears of a clown kind of thing. Yeah, I mean the, the interesting thing with I also, I think Ethan Phillips is is incredible yeah. I, as an actor. I think I think Voyager may have the most talented full cast of actors. Interesting because uh, because uh, I mean, and that show is like the definition of mid. I mean, if it wasn't for how good like those actors were, yeah. Uh, that show would be we, we like everyone would hate that show. Yeah. But um. But yeah, I mean, the thing is, he knows he's the morale officer. So you're right. Like, he is, there is a Tears of a Clown thing going on. Like, he's trying to put on a brave face for people. And then they find that face annoying. Right. But they're also like, yeah, yeah well, there's really nothing else to watch. I mean, the Neil show is kind of all we have. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, look, man, I love Neelix. I love Tom Paris. I love all, I love all those characters, God damn it. <laughs> um, but, um, but what was I going to say? But, but TOS, though. The, how they end every episode with the little fun flute right. and the yeah. little joke. Do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah. That's the... I. That's kind of most of where we get the sense that these people like each other. Because the rest of the episode, they're dealing with like a teenager who's, who has magic powers. Yeah. Or an ex-Starfleet officer who has magic powers. Or <laughs> a big box in space that's f***ing them. Like... Or like the, the, the Daystrom's computer destroying the shit, like some or the or the Tony the Tiger guy <laughs> going crazy, <laughs> like so much of those TOS episodes are ship in jeopardy episodes, yes, yeah. um, or people in jeopardy, like we're like we're either we're either our strings are being pulled by a malevolent trickster god or the ship has eight minutes to live, yeah, yeah, and so those little scenes at the end, it's like. Oh, that that's kind of really where you get the sense that Spock and Kirk are super close buddies, that they can, like, rib on each other and tease each other and that, like, you know, I, what, what do you think? What do you, I, I've never thought about this, but what do you think? I think that you're right. I think that that is probably the maximum amount of comedy that Gene Roddenberry wanted on the show. He was very against the show being funny um, when... Uh, Trouble with Tribbles came out, uh, it was kind of a sensation. People were like, oh, these characters and these actors specifically are like funny and are finding humor in these roles. And Gene hated it. And it actually led to his producer, uh, his showrunner on the show, Gene Kuhn, started to think about maybe getting a different job because Gene Kuhn liked the funny elements. He liked seeing these characters like each other, like you said, and finding humor in what they do. And Gene was really against that. And if Gene, of course, I, I didn't bother digging up like quotes from him on Star Trek Four because he goes back and forth as the years like continue. But he did initially like really not like a lot of the stuff in Star Trek Four, and I think specifically didn't like the humor. But I, I think that like it's so important to if you if you told somebody I'm watching this show, it's really great, and it's not funny at all. <laughs> like unless it was The Walking Dead. Or, uh, I don't know, like maybe some other horror show. Even horror can be funny sometimes. It would be weird to think that we only like this thing because it's not funny. And as somebody who appreciates comedy, I've just started noticing that like it's either not funny or like a lot of the modern 
Paramount Plus shows who try really hard and like have a lot of cool things on them. They have all these jokes that are just boiled down to like, <laughs> that happened. And like just sort of not like funny things that are um, looking at like the characters and their interactions, you know, like that organic kind of comedy. So I would like to see that in Star Trek. Now, of course, before anybody says anything, yes, there is Lower Decks. We have the animated show that is a, a comedy show and it has jokes. Most of those jokes are kind of like, hey, look at this thing from Star Trek. That's still valid. That's still a form of comedy. But I'd like to see something. I'd like to see a funny character. I'd like to see a, like a comedic actor, you know, uh, show up on Star Trek. Um, try to find the, the funny parts of their universe. They've done it before. They're doing it in this film. See, it's, see I, I think you're very specifically talking about like comedy relief. Because even an episode like The Trouble of Tribbles, that serves as like comedic relief in a full season where like a, a seven-year-old bald Ron Howard alien <laughs> wants to f- screw up the ship, yeah. you know, or like or like they all get teleported back to the past. And if they don't let a lady get hit by a car, <laughs> Hitler wins. It's like... <laughs> Yeah, the well, that was the first season. Like, but yeah, you know, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah but, but I'm saying, like, kind of like much like the scenes where Uhura would like hit on Spock a little bit. Yeah, just kind of take the piss out of him. Yeah, like that's like that's comedy relief in an episode. Yeah. Um, you know, an ep like an episode like Trouble of Trolls is like comedy relief in a season. Yeah. and even like Star Trek Four, I think you couldn't start with this one. You sure. couldn't. Yeah, like. You have to like these characters and know why they're funny. Yeah. In order to, like, you know, because I mean, don't forget, like, like the movie before this, like Spock, like dies but gets brought back to life by like a torpedo, and the movie after this, like they kill God with a torpedo. <laughs> yeah. Like so, it's like, yeah, maybe we could just all like Let's all chill the for funny a second, one in like, there. yeah, <laughs> try to help some whales. Yeah, a little, little tiny bit. See, the interesting thing for me about Star Trek IV is, and I, look, I know nothing about its pre-production history. I'm going to rely on you for that. I get the sense that that uh, Leonard Nimoy and the producer of this, I, what's his name, Urban Meyer? Or? Harv Bennett. Harv Bennett, yeah, because it's a Harv Bennett production and story by Harv Bennett and screenplay by Harv. Like, Harv Bennett's all about oh, yeah. the movie. Yeah. Like, uh, um, I get the sense that like Harv Bennett and Leonard Nimoy Really thought they were doing something good for the world with this whale stuff. <laughs> I think someone like Nicholas Meyer was like, "All right, look, I'm going to give them their whales, but I'm going to write a lot of think scenes that I want to yeah, see." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it's kind of it kind of like ended up like this. Like, what was the like what was the original pitch and the first draft? Like, can you tell me about like the early iterations of this? Film? Oh yeah, I'll totally totally get into it. In fact, we'll we'll talk about the technical uh, details right now. I wanted to mention first. Uh, you're an X Files fan, right? Oh yes, of course. I've seen every episode. Yeah, and the X Files is like always dealing with somebody is like eating livers or like aliens or like raping people or whatever. And they would tend to have like you know Mulder would be kind of a goofy guy. It's down to like David Duchovny is kind of like persona. But there would be sometimes they would have episodes, maybe one or two a season, that would just be full on comedic things where they would like very expertly kind of deconstruct like the whole like tone and premise of the series. And like I wish that Star Trek could do something like that. I wish Star Trek could have its um, Clyde Bruckman's Final Repose, you know, or Bad Blood or something like that. Have an episode where they just kind of point out because Star Trek is like ripe for. Uh, for knocking the clay feet out, you know, it is ostentatious. It's a bunch of uh, fancy people in the future looking down on people in the 20th, 20th century, you know, and I, I think it can be taken down. And I'm worried that uh, that they're worried that they can't attack their premise too much because it is, you know, it's this wonderful future. But I think there's there's got to be things to laugh at. Look, the people who are making Star Trek now, God bless them. They're, the, the problem is they're on the internet. And like... <laughs> That's a like, great point. Way back That's when, a great point. Yeah. like, like way back when, like you made a season of a TV show and you really didn't know people hated it until you were making the next season right. of your t- until you were like halfway through the next season of your TV show. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like one of the problems with modern Trek is that it's people who don't know what they want. Like season one of discovery is like the, it's like that. I like the only modern Trek I really, really watched was like season one of discovery, season two of discovery, season one of Picard. Yeah. And like with season one of discovery, it was clear that while well, these people sure do like Battlestar Galactica, I mean, right down to the, a lot of the casting, Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, and uh, the dark uh, torture sequences and things like that. 
Um, but I'm like, I don't know if you guys is that what Star Trek is? Love, yeah, Star Trek. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I don't know, man. With this tiger eating up the lady from Battlestar Galactica and all this stuff and a guy bringing a phaser to bed. It's like, okay. I mean, I think it's like, I think this stuff is interesting and cool. Yeah. But then, but then also, I also don't like when they're like, well, if we don't make an episodic series called Brave New Worlds. Someone will firebomb our house. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. So out of so out of the safety, out of, out of wanting to keep my family safe, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, like, I mean, I mean, but that, but then the other thing is, I don't know if science fiction fans could ever be happy. Well, like, yeah, 100% I think we also true. really yeah. like complaining. Yeah. Like, like I'm also a big wrestling fan, and I really think we like complaining about media. Yeah. It's more interesting because, like, when you see something great, like like the Wrath of Khan, you're like, "Yeah, it was a really good movie. I really liked it." You can only talk about how much you liked something. You could talk about how much you hated something forever, <laughs> yeah, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that's all nerds have done for de- for decades it's, and generations. It's is true. like they're hard to please. Yeah, they, yeah, they get they get together in these little coffee shops, these little science fiction clubs in colleges, and they get together at Denny's at two in the morning, and they just like bitch and bitch and bitch about the series finale to Battlestar Galactica or Lost and it's like yeah look I didn't like those either and I will bitch about them but I realize that I am the problem yeah <laughs> so, that, I never, so hopefully that makes me <laughs> I never made that connection before to to Battlestar and not like you know they're, they're not they don't have like a ragtag fleet or anything but like in that first season of Discovery and in some of the se- subsequent seasons but I think it lightens up um, it is going for like this dark edgy kind of thing and I'm not saying that Trek can't be edgy in some circumstances, but I think you're right. I think that they are aware through the internet or whatever that everybody's eyes are on them. And so they have to do what people kind of expect them to do, but still surprise them at the same time, which is impossible. And I think the bravest thing to do would be, and I think I hope Strange New Worlds is going to do this, is to be corny, is to own being corny or own being Star Trek and what you are, this goofy thing where people read Shakespeare and, you know, try to talk you know, to aliens instead of killing them and just kind of own that and see where that gets you. Because otherwise you're just competing with Battlestar. You're competing with, I don't know. uh, The Expanse. The Expanse. Yeah, there's no way you can compete with The Expanse in terms of realism. And just sort of like owning your spot is like, look, this is what what you guys want, right? This is, you want people who are going to talk instead of shoot. I I mean, I really liked season two of Discovery because of how kind of, corny Anson Mount was playing and I guess I mean that in the best way possible where it was just like oh wow I I would love to serve under this captain he seems really cool yeah. and he like like I like it's it, it's so interesting like the times he would give his employees feedback which is like a weird thing to say on Star Trek but like you know you know you know he like he'd be like uh Mr. Saru like I appreciate that you're going through a through a crisis where you're like discovering a new part of yourself, but I, I, I would question the veracity of letting uh, two members of the crew uh, punch each other <laughs> in the yeah. in the commissary. Like even like even his like even his uh, admonitions were like slight. And I remember like when he's when he's like dealing with the Saru's planet. Like he he doesn't like threaten to kill the bad guys. He's not like I'm gonna wipe you guys out. He he goes like he goes, please choose your next move carefully. Yeah, like yeah. he's cool. Like I like which is why like I am very interested to see Brave New Worlds because like I like this guy. I like I like young angry Spock. <laughs> I like what's her name Mystique is number one. I do want to hear more about number one. Like. I am excited. I think I'm most excited about Brave New Worlds than anything yeah. in New Trek. Well, we'll get to find out soon. It comes out in May. Oh my okay. God. Yeah, I, I have I've been I've been holding off on watching that trailer. But like um but yeah, I mean, you know, you know, kinda like back to like back to Star Trek four, like um it's it's so I mean, it's so nice. I, I, I adjusted for inflation. Isn't it the highest growing 
grossing of them or like adjusted for inflation is that still like jj abrams trek one? well i i can i'll give you all the numbers on it uh including the fact that it would it came out on november 26th of 1986 and it was written by steve mearson peter creeks harv bennett and nicholas meyer the stories by leonard nimoy and harv bennett directed by leonard nimoy produced by harv bennett uh the start date they give is 2390 Point zero. Of course, it takes place also in 1986. The budget was 26 million. The box office was 133 million of uh, 1986 dollars. Uh, and on the list of grossing uh, highest grossing Trek films adjusted for inflation, it used to sit at number one. It now sits at number five, behind from one to four: uh, Star Trek Into Darkness, Star Trek The Motion Picture, Star Trek 2009, and Star Trek Beyond. Star Trek The Motion Picture was a Inge- was it adjusted for inflation? So huge box office success. Yes. Now seventy nine to eighty six, a uh, bit of a recession in there. Also, the motion picture, <laughs> the motion picture, huge bo, bafo bo. But also, it cost a ton. So Paramount viewed it oh. as a failure, but it made a ton of money. Okay, uh, you know what? I'm glad we're starting, but talking about this. Does it kind of bother you that this is the second Star Trek movie within four Star, Star Trek movies where? A, Big probe come to Earth, mess up Earth, unless we could talk to the probe. Not to mention the fact that the TOS episode, The Changeling, features a probe that was sent out by Earth hundreds of years before and then comes back all messed up. And the Enterprise has to sort of talk it down. So a lot of people call the motion picture uh, where Nomad has gone before for that reason. (laughs) I... Yeah, see, to me, I never, like, as a kid, I was just like, yeah, I just assumed that they were just like, yeah, let's just do that episode again, but bigger. Yeah. But, oh, no, yeah, Roddenberry steals from himself all the time. Yeah. But this, but but in rewatching this as an adult, this is the first time I was like, hey, wait a minute. There might be a slight <laughs> flaw with one of, with my favorite Star Trek. Wait, I think... <laughs> why did I turn 40? Why am I seeing the, why am I seeing the failures in, in, in my faves? <laughs> uh, now, as far as ratings go, uh, it is also number five on the top rated films, uh, and the highest rated is Star Trek 2009, then Star Trek First Contact, Wrath of Khan, Into Darkness, and Voyage Home. That's all on Rotten Tomatoes. And the fact that, uh, let's see, well, Beyond doesn't make it into the top five, but Star Trek is number one and Into Darkness is number four. I think we've proven that the institution of Rotten Tomatoes is just is rotten. Yeah, I mean, I don't care about what they say. Like, um, it's, I, I mean, for me, it's just kind of like, what would you rather watch? Like, I don't. Oh, I, yeah, right. I, wa- like, I, I saw First Contact, I think, twice in the theater as a kid. Like, yeah. um, I don't want to watch that now. Like, I don't want to watch, like, <laughs> Captain Picard, like, shooting a cadet who's begging for his life to death and then <laughs> saying he's going to do him, he's doing him a favor and. I don't want to see Lieutenant Hawk get turned into a Borg and get sliced up. Like, I, well, I liked Lieutenant Hawk. That guy seemed pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, but you get to see uh, Zephyrin Cochran dance to Roy Orbison. That, I want more of that. Those I parts want, are I fun. want more of yeah. the magic carpet ride sequence. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's fun. That's a lot more fun if it's just like, you know, less zombie but i guess with that what i'm just, i'm just saying like i don't know i'm gonna go back and like watch first contact or go back and like watch into darkness um yeah you know i'll go back and i'll watch star trek the motion picture because it's like the world's prettiest screensaver even now it's so beautiful to watch and the music oh, yeah. is so oh yeah there's another thing i'm gonna complain about with this movie is this the Uh-oh. is this a star trek movie with the worst original music interesting that you would say that because of course they couldn't get uh they couldn't get james horner back who had done the last two films and i i don't know if you have a favorite um i you know i vacillate between jerry goldsmith and james horner they're both really up there for me in terms of the music but yeah they did get a new guy um for this movie and I don't know, is it bad? Like, is Leonard Rosenman's, like, com- compositions bad? Or is he doing a, uh, playing a different game here? Like, he's, you know, scoring something that's set in the modern day. There's a lot of comedy. There's whales and literal creatures and things in it. Um, I don't know. I, I, there's, there's parts where I think it kind of shines. 
I definitely agree that all the stuff in San Francisco, where it is just like where the soundtrack is pretty much taken right out of Beverly Hills Cop, all that stuff is great. I'm not going to complain about like those like big saxophone stings a la Short Circuit or Short Circuit 2, much shorter circuit. But I'd yeah. like you to play the opening theme right now, like the stuff they play over the credits. Sure. Just play it while I'm talking. And now... Ho, ho, ho! It's me, Santa Kirk! <laughs> Merry Christmas from Star Trek IV! Like, this, the mu- it sounds like it's the music from, like, Mi- Miracle on 34th Street or Home Alone, or... It just, it doesn't sound Trekky at all. The, 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 like, the main theme from Star Trek IV. Um, there really, like, no bells or anything like that. Uh, sometimes you get that in, uh, in Star Trek scores. I want, but, but like no big pump and brass where it's like, uh oh, we better get these whales back. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, like <laughs> I need like that urgency kind of stuff. I mean, I think that like my favorite Star Trek score is definitely from Star Trek One, um, which you know gave us the obviously like the Next Generation theme, and then I also really love yeah. that one Michael Giacano song from Star Trek, the with like the lone French horn in the wilderness. Like representing oh, like okay. a tiny okay. ship in a in an immeasurably dangerous galaxy. The thing I don't understand yeah, is, yeah, yeah. hey, you know what Star Wars do? They really reuse their music a lot, and it's like it's like guys, you're allowed to do that. You 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 paid for it. I mean, instead of hiring a whole new <laughs> right. guy, like how about you just use some of these other? It's like. Guys, you own yeah, the you, score. Yeah, you reuse footage. They re, they reuse footage all the time. They reuse sets. Reuse the, the score. They reuse sets. <laughs> yeah, right. They take sets yeah. from the next yeah. generation. It's like, guys, yeah. you can dun, dun dun dun. It's like you have that. Do you need to borrow my eight? You need to borrow my cassette. I had it on cassette. Yeah, they reused it for the show. Yeah, yes. so when they did Next Generation, yeah. so they yeah. reused it for the show. And a ton of Star Trek fans. I have never seen the first Star Trek movie because they were all told it's terrible. So they just think that's the next generation theme. And then I think that's it. I think that's it for my complaints about Star Trek four. I like because I because I totally forgot everything that happened in Star Trek three. And I feel like in a modern movie, they would have not addressed it at all or just like addressed it with a throwaway line where they were like, welcome back, Spock. They're like, I see you shaking off. You, you did this crazy computer test. And oh, wait, let's talk about the crazy computer test. So, so here's how like every character gets introduced. Like, Kirk's like, attention. All right, we're all mutineers. And like, this kind of like, reads everybody's name. And it's like just a general panning shot. And, like, that's how the entire cast is introduced in this movie. Like, compare that to, like, Star Trek Two, where, like, Captain Kirk is introduced, like, like God himself, like, angelic light, like, shining behind him, eating an apple, <laughs> yeah. and, like, congratulating a hot Vulcan lady on dying. Um, except, of course, for the director of the film, Leonard Nimoy, who's introduced right. answering a hundred very difficult computer questions on eight computers simultaneously. Oh, and before that, he's uh, up on top of Vasquez Rocks, the famous Star Trek rocks. Kirk sees him, you know, yes, in his robe. you're right. Like some religious figure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the first time we see him, he's like shrouded in mystery and looking super badass. And then yeah, he's give like... Give me the good shot. Yeah. yeah I'm the director. Exactly. <laughs> like, that's another thing I guess I could complain about. Kind of weak character introductions for everybody except Spock. But at the same time, well, we all like Spock the best, right? I mean, come on. Oh, yeah. Spock's awesome. Yeah, I want to talk about how the film came together because you've already kind of mentioned uh, maybe unknowingly some of the elements that were involved in it. You know, as I said earlier, uh, Paramount just said, do what you want to do. And uh, Nimoy and Bennett started working on ideas for it. And they had to work with the the idea that William Shatner might not be back. He wanted an increase in his compensation from previous films and the negotiations were not going well. So they started to develop this premise for a prequel film featuring a young Kirk and Spock in their Academy days. Uh, Now, of course the dispute was settled. Shatner did uh, work out to come back to the film and that idea was abandoned, but Paramount essentially recycled that idea for the 2009 JJ Abrams reboot. I mean, we're basically seeing young Kirk and Spock in the Academy Um, at the time of the original series. Shatner and Nimoy, because of their sort of competition, had clauses in their contracts that stipulated that whatever one, whatever gain one performer received, the other would as well. And since Shatner 
held out for this pay raise, that meant Nimoy would receive a pay raise as well. And at this point, even though, you know, the films are successful, Paramount is looking at this and thinking, all right, how high is this going to go? And it was at that point that they began the process of developing a return to TV for Star Trek, The Next Generation. They thought, we need actors who don't have <laughs> slick agents and we need <laughs> no names and we need, uh, you know, something that we can control. So let's make The Next Generation. I mean, I guess that kind of explains why they shot everything in 1986, because <laughs> it's like, OK, right. a lot of yeah. our budget yeah. is going to these two stars. Uh, yeah. I, oh, right. And uh, yeah. didn't they yeah. not get what's her name from Cheers back? Isn't Savick played by someone else? Yeah. In three. Yeah. And then it continues into four. Yeah. Because she just didn't want to do it. It was like her first movie and everybody's like, she's great. And she's like, I am great. I'm not doing another Star Trek. And she's out of there. Oh, that's terrible. Okay. I, I, all right. Yeah. Because I'm seeing her and I'm like, all right, well, I guess there's some money saved. <laughs> like, I guess. <laughs> right. Took, yeah. Yeah. I guess you told you told Sulu that the next time he'd be a captain, which he like totally pipes up at at the end. <laughs> yeah, where he's like, I'm going putting to that Excelsior. Off. <laughs> yeah sure you are buddy yeah we'll see <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i mean look i definitely love it when actors go like it's time to eat because like acting is truly feast or famine i don't know yeah any other times that like that like either leonard nimoy or william shatner could kind of have somebody over a barrel. It's like, yeah, that's true. You know what that's I mean? True. It's it's like I don't know yeah. how much hardball he could play on T.J. Hooker or Boston Legal. So it's like you know when yeah. you look when you can play hardball, you should play hardball. Like I like I can't hold that against them. I I think that's actually really admirable. Yeah, and it's really only time that took that away from them, either by you know dying if you're DeForest Kelly or just being in in your 90s like uh William Shatner like there you can't really negotiate but he, six films they did and then when they did the next film for the next crew he even came back again because you can't replace Captain Kirk no. until of course he can't play the role anymore and then you just yes. get somebody else is this the first movie where you're kind of like these guys are getting they're running around and they look a little old like if for they me, really are yeah, it, outrunning it cops feel- <laughs> It, yeah, yeah. It felt that way a little for me. There's stories about I, I always felt like um Shatner looks looks pretty great in all the Star Trek films, but there's stories about him, you know, being the, there's the Captain Kirk weight, you know. And look, you're a rich actor, you've got a lot of syndication money. What are you gonna do? You're gonna hang out and, you know, just you know, eat and just do whatever you do when you're collecting uh rescue nine one one checks. But whenever a new Star Trek film came in, he would get back into shape, you know, and he would get into Captain Kirk's shape. And this is the first movie where he's not quite there. And also, I think his face is a little too red. Like, he just doesn't... He He's starting to change. He's starting to look a little different from what we remember. But, you know, he does all the underwater scenes and they are running from cops and, and you know, just uh, doing all the stunts and stuff like that. So I think they're still, they're still up there. I love Six. Six is a great movie, but a lot of body doubles in Six. A lot of people are not really doing the things that those characters are doing in Six. Something about Six, it's kind of cool that they're all old in Six. Yeah. Where it's like, look, they're old, but they're still kicking ass. They're in like this weird like middle period in Star Trek Four. Where I had to like convince myself, like, well, I guess they have like twenty third century conditioning, which is sure, why yeah. like this one little Russian guy can outrun everyone on a <laughs> nuclear submarine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, okay, and uh, you know I, these guys can outrun the cops, and because you know they're in the military. I don't know. Yeah, I, right. <laughs> this is the first. Also, like, you kind of notice. Look. I look. If you want to wear guy liner, you should wear guy liner. I'm not here to tell you not to wear guy liner. I'm just saying this is the first time I noticed that Captain Kirk was wearing guy liner. Did you? What did bit. you think of his guy liner? Uh, it was probably more than they should have had. Yeah, it's, I don't think they knew the remastering technology and the Blu-ray <gasps> technology that we'd have. But yeah, it oh, does come through a little. You're right. You know what? It's like it's like all those old eight bits that look good on those old CRT TVs. I yeah, bet if we yeah. watched this on a CRT TV, they'd look like a bunch of strapping young hunks. Oh yeah, if you play this on your you know eleven inch black and white that you had in your basement when you were a kid, I bet it looks really great. All right, start stop the podcast. <laughs> I'll <laughs> be right the... back. <laughs> Remember the little thing for the Atari? We had to like screw the the leads onto the 
other on, onto the back yes. of the TV to get it to work. Yeah. Yes. All right. That, uh, that'll make DeForest well, Kelly look less sad. All right. Speaking, <laughs> speaking of people seeming old, uh, the next uh, story idea that Nimoy and Bennett uh, lighted on was a story in which the earth is being ravaged by a plague and the only cure to the plague would come from a plant that had gone extinct centuries ago. And that that later got changed to whales. But it makes me it, it reminds me of do you remember the uh, Sean Connery movie Medicine Man from the early 90s? I absolutely don't. Sean Connery is a it's a total white savior thing, but he like lives in the Amazon and it's an environmental thing, right? We're cutting down the Amazon and he's like, I found the cure for cancer. He's like found this amazing drug, but loggers want to uh, cut the forest down. And so he's got to do like a Alan Quartermain type thing and, you know, swing from a vine and, and, and stop them so he can save these plants. That's kind of what it reminded me of. How fast are they chopping down this? How much of this plant is there? Like, I feel like. Look, man, I'm just saying, I feel like you if, if you had a week to get the cure, I feel like I don't know how much cancer cure plants these people could destroy in a week. <laughs> I mean, was there what? And, yeah. and the thing is, if there's Bulldozers only like a very, notoriously fast. Yeah. <laughs> no, look, those loggers go. No, I did see Fern Gully. But like, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I love that they changed it from plants to whales because you give more of a shit about the livelihood of whales yeah like, it has personality yeah. yeah yeah like when those whales are like endangered in the end which is kind of like the only time that there's like a villain i like that's one of the other things I like about star trek for like it's very mild villainy like yeah. those whalers are clearly just trying to feed their starving families right i mean the fact that like right. the enterprise like <laughs> yeah. stopped them from killing these whales like probably doomed their children their children for a life of starvation right how does it what's the butterfly effect there does that uh, check off disappear or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like um, like they were Russian whalers. Yeah, and then, you know those guys were wearing evil black scally caps. That one guy kept yeah. spinning. <laughs> that one guy was spinning that wheel around too much. I'm like, look, man, you can spin that wheel all you, <laughs> you want. Have gone, it's 720. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's going <laughs> all the way around. <laughs> he's doing like an ollie with his shit, <laughs> like grinding on the cloaked Klingon vessel. Like, um, I like that. <laughs> what else do I like about this film? Yeah, all right. So they spend the first half hour kind of like dealing with stuff from Star Trek Three that I totally forgot about, and. Yeah. And I really, really liked how this movie did not hold my hand and like have a scene where someone was like, remember this, this, that, 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 like there wasn't a ton of exposition and I appreciated the movie kind of trusted me to figure out what happened. Like, ah, okay, there's a torpedo. It's like, you know, we like we like getting that exposition from the Klingon perspective is very interesting because you know that you're getting like a very biased version of what happened and that yeah, makes yeah. it more fun. Like it's more fun yeah. to kind of hear like the better call Saul recap. Like what, like what Saul Goodman's like interpretation of whatever the hell happened to this movie. I haven't watched it since I was a teenager. Um, but you know, it really boils <laughs> down to just like, yo, Spock's disconnected from his humanity and he's kind of got to get his mojo back. And that's yeah. a nice little arc you can complete in a film yeah that's kind of the only arc that anybody really has in the film i think is, yes. is spock reconnecting to his humanity and then also plugging into that mccoy who in the last film spent most of his time on his back just going on oh, my head and doesn't get to interact with spock but he has done this amazing thing for him he's like literally saved his life and his soul and so getting to play out the aftermath of that where he's like so tell me what death is like and spock's like yeah i, I got to do this and and he's trying to like you know he he wants to connect with this guy who he did this thing for even though they fight and they they clash over things uh but then he realizes like how <laughs> how, they, how much they don't actually get along and he's just trying to get a straight answer out of him and he's being Spock and uh and, but but he helps him at the end regain his own kind of humanity by like you know just give us your best guess because you know we trust you and uh, know that you'll do a good job I j I loved how small like seemingly small the arc is but because we care about Spock, we're like, yeah, we kind of do want, it's like, we as an audience, like, we do want the old Spock back. And then also, it's very convenient that he, like, 
has forgotten how to act like a human because he's put down in 1986. Right. <laughs> and because, like, you know, Spock, yeah, he would do the thing where he's like, yeah, I don't lie. I may omit. <laughs> like, right. but yeah, like he's been yeah he went to the, the the 1930s ones like he knows how to do this right exactly but like reboots rebooted spock don't know how to do yeah he's this been stuff. turned off and on a couple times yeah he's been rebooted a few times now yeah it's just like we got like safe mode spock and it's like uh oh <laughs> that's not good this because, gotta load the extensions one by one yeah right exactly because like it it turns him into an obstacle which is yeah. cool because it's like I love Spock, but Spock is causing problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it was great. Yeah, and then he has to dump him off, and then he gets to spend one-on-one time with uh, Jillian Taylor's character, who is kind of a love interest. Not really. It's more just like a woman for Kirk to hang out with. Uh, and then we get the scene with them in the restaurant, and, and they bond, and so on and so forth. Yeah, like Nicholas Meyer knows how to write a screenplay; like it's very well structured. I wanted to mention fast, like I don't know if our younger listeners would remember Save the Whales, which was yeah. probably at its peak in 1986. Um, this idea of like pop environmentalism, uh, which I don't know what it accomplished; it doesn't seem like much, but it was a real big thing back then. I think that that's kind of like the core of what Nimoy wanted to do, you know, let's have an environmental message. Why not, you know, the whales, why not save the whales? See the, see the interesting thing is I think it worked. Like I'm watching this movie and they're like, yeah, those whales, they died off in like the 21st century. And I'm like, you know what? Because the eighties made us fall in love with these gentle giants of the sea. We will always have at least two whales somewhere because you can make money off them too. Like in this in this movie, they're like, yeah, no one's coming to see these whales. I guess we got to set them free because we can't afford these whales. Now, <laughs> like, SeaWorld is like, we can't get rid of these whales. These whales right. are like little ATM machines that right. occasionally... Right, going to back our whale NFTs? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like stuff like... It's like this stuff worked. It made us, it made us like whales en- enough to keep a couple of them around even when they chomp your employees, which they do. <laughs> yeah, they do do they that. They do that. <laughs> and it's kind of like, can you blame them? I can't. I'm you know, a stereo Coconuts, Sp- and I can't blame these whales for what they do. <laughs> I say, bite them, whales. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's I'm funny not saying I like it. I'm saying I understand it. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> when Nicholas Meyer, in his original version of the script, he had Jillian staying behind in the present. Um and she was like committed to like, okay, now I know how important it is. No matter what, I'm going to make sure that these whales never die out. Now, whether or not she could be successful in that, it does like point out a temporal paradox. Like if she saves the whales, there will be whales. Will that change all of the future? And the reason that Nicholas Meyer wanted that is he felt like taking the whales from the, from the past and also taking her from the past was too easy. Like it kind of blunted the um, the ecological message of the film. That, oh, sure, we're worried about, like, the rainforest and the whales right now, but, like, Space Daddy will just come and, like, save us in the future. And he wanted people to think about the fact that nobody is coming to save us. And I don't want to get too deep. We've gotten pretty deep already. But I think this is one of modern Trek's problems, is the fact that Trek is, it's great to have a utopian future to aspire to and look at and hold up as something that we want. But, like, what are we really doing about it and like the kind it's become like this kind of liberal fantasy that we can look at and go well we've got that as our world burns around us and i don't know i'm on a lot of star trek groups you know on the internet and a lot of people don't want to talk about politics a lot of people are saying that they're making trek too political and i feel like trek's message of what we need to get to utopia isn't disseminating through the people that watch star trek you know see it's it's interesting because you're kind of bringing up like two different there's like two different issues that you're teasing out there like the first is is the idea of like consumerism as activism like yeah you yeah, know yeah, yeah. the whole idea of, of of like yeah i mean like it's it's funny because sometimes i would work on like environmentally driven reality tv shows like as like a production assistant or something and i'd be like yeah we sure are throwing out a lot of plastic cups here huh yeah, okay, right. but I don't know. What if uh, somebody watches this and they grow up to, uh, I don't know, save an ape? All right, 
there there you go i guess i could keep throwing these cups yeah. away yeah. Like, yeah like like you know there's like there is a limit to what there's a limit to like what uh, t like message media can accomplish but i don't know i like to think if you just put enough of it out there you, know, you have someone will someone will get the message maybe not me someone will but then look let's talk about the more fun thing which is toxic online discourse um sure you can't convince these people that star trek has always been political and kind of what they want is to argue with you because what they yeah. want is like your attention and they want to like take all their little talking points out for a spin and like they want to make you mad so they can screen cap your tweets and take those tweets back to 4chan as like trophies for other people. So like if I had an environmental, if I had a message for listeners to this podcast, it would be you d don't fucking bother with these idiots like they're, right. they're on they're unreachable. And they don't want to be reached. And so you kind of just got to, I don't know, if you could kick them out of your forum, do that. I don't know, ban yeah. them. Restrict their free speech. How about that? Do that. That'll so, fix it. <laughs> just buy the whole platform. So the two th takeaways for, for our series here are don't try to change people's minds and whales go hot. Go ahead and bite, people. Oh, yeah. Look, I mean, hmm. Wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. You're locked in. No, no, no. You're locked nope. in. Oh, no, no. I have zero problems with I have zero problems with that summation of my position. I'm trying okay, to think okay. of like what if those whales by getting taken what if one of those whales was gonna chomp on someone who was gonna give who was what if one of those whales was gonna chomp on Hitler too? Because <laughs> see the see like the fun thing like the thing about Star Trek four is that like, yeah, are they creating problems in the timeline? Yeah, but they're all they all seem kind of small. It's like they probably would have figured out transparent <laughs> aluminum anyway. Like what's two less whales? This lady, right. she like seemed like nobody really liked her at that institute they worked at. Oh, like, no, they that, even... that, no, her story is crazy because basically the whales leave, she slaps her boss, quits her job, drives off in her crappy pickup, and is never seen again. Nobody knows what happens to that lady. They tell that story around the Monterey Aquarium, I'm sure, like for, for years. Yeah, but they, they tell that story to be like, and that's a lesson to you. Don't get too attached to these whales. Don't, yeah, forget about the whales. <laughs> Just rip the tickets and sell the Diet Cokes, okay? Yeah. <laughs> like, right. We're here to make money. <laughs> I love the idea that, like, you think Khan's bad, but there's some guy we don't even know about that a whale would have eaten if he just left the whales back there. But now we've got, like, yeah, Hitler 2 or, or Khan squared. Yeah. Maybe, what, if, what if one of them whales was going to chomp on Khan's great-great-grandpa? I mean, we know these whales chomp on people. They made a whole documentary about it. And it's not yeah. the documentary that I like to watch. It's a much darker one. <laughs> um, that's another thing I like about Star Trek Four, where you don't, don't worry about it too much. They steal a very small amount of nuclear fuel. I like that. <laughs> they don't yes. like have to like stu they don't like have to release like tetrazine gas on the ship and knock out everybody. They're just like we need. We need to give a bit of this fuel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. We need. We need enough to fit in this in this uh, Game Boy. <laughs> okay. Are you are you are you are you familiar with with what's going on on Picard season two right now? I've been told by Google yeah. that it's okay. connected to this movie. I am. It, well, yes. I yes, I, I surrender. I am willing to be spoiled. I surrender. Well, I, I will do like setting spoilers, but not, you know, individual plot spoilers. But okay. yes, uh, Picard and his crew must go back into the past to, you know, to right a wrong, to uh, to change something that was changed. And it, they go back to 2024 uh, Los Angeles. And it's L.A., not San Fran. And it's a different, you know, decade. It's not the 80s. But they put a ton of uh, references to Star Trek IV into it, both, I think, as a wink nod, but also as a, you know, we talked about it before. Why not steal from yourself? Like, you can yeah. do your own stuff over again. Yeah. Hmm. But it has a much more political angle. Now, instead of environmentalism, it's, um, you know, one of the characters is uh, is Latin American. And so he gets picked up by ICE because he doesn't have any identification or anything like that. And so they have to, like, break him out of a detention center. You know, I never thought I'd be yearning for the subtlety of Star Trek 4. <laughs> but you've <Yeah>. made me... <laughs> 
<laughs> well, let's let's move on to something more entertaining. You've, you've, then. you've, you've made me really appreciate, <laughs> like literally, somebody turning towards the camera and going, going, "Wow, we really Earth really did seal our own fate when we let these whales die." <laughs> If only we, if only I, ho- I hope if if so- I hope someone out there won't let that. Happen. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just that baffled. That is incredible to me that I did not know Picard took place in in season in season uh, in in the year 2024. Wait, when you say when you say Picard's crew, do you mean like like his 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 best crew ever, like Jordy LaForge? Dr. Oh Reverend no, that's Crusher. that's season three. They're, they'll, they're coming back in season three. No, this is the crew from season one: uh, Seven, Rafi, uh, Rios, and, and those guys. I mean, I like those guys, but yeah. like, this this is this is okay. I don't. I haven't watched anything about Star Trek season two yet. I know the Q shows up. Like, right? Q can't uh, put the band back together. <laughs> what is he out of Q flashes? <laughs> Like why? Uh, um, why not too far off? <laughs> oh, he's only got enough Q power to get cheaper actors. He's like he's like every he's like he's like we. Well, I don't have costumes enough costumes and sets. I don't yeah. have enough Q flash to to summon Michael Dorn. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, he ke- he keeps asking for bumps, and we don't, and we, we and we take that personally for some reason. We're out of Q juice. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sure that you know that we were this close to Eddie Murphy being in this film. I didn't. Wait, Eddie but hold Murphy. on. Wait, before we talk yeah. about that, I do want to say, yeah. what? so what if his Q juice is affected by the actor's Q rating? And he only has like enough Q juice. Like he uses like, he uses, he, he's like, I, I used most of this to get Jerry Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry you're gonna have to you're gonna have to deal with that lady that killed maddox and uh and right, that guy yeah. that's got that and that guy that's got more interesting holograms than main characters yeah and maybe some uh my little pony voice actors wait who yeah. tell me everything he's delancey is is a voice of one of the ponies oh, on, uh, well, oh is magic. Uh, well but he wouldn't yeah. summon himself I okay. You're talking about how you're talking about Discord, the trickster pony. No, he wouldn't summon himself in public, or would he? Okay, but wait, Eddie Murphy. Who was Eddie Murphy going to play? Eddie Murphy was a big Star Trek fan. Uh, he's got that whole run he does in uh, Delirious about Star Trek. And after Beverly Hills Cop came out, he had a little cachet. So he went to Paramount and he said, "Hey, I, can I be in the next Star Trek film?" And he got the guy that wrote Beverly Hills Cop to do a treatment of the movie. Um, but nobody really liked it. And the role that they eventually developed for him was he was going to play like a astrophysicist uh, who uh, worked at Berkeley, who was like a you know a UFO fanatic. Uh, and Eddie was like, nah, I'm going to do The Golden Child instead. And we all know how that turned out. See, I only know The Golden Child is that movie that was on Comedy Central Monday through Friday. <laughs> Yeah, constantly, so, okay. nonstop. I didn't, yeah, I didn't yeah. know. Oh, wow, it didn't do well. Oh, yikes, okay. So his character, you know, became Jillian Taylor, uh, who's a much better character, I think, when the, that this other character sounds like. And I guess it could have worked. It kind of reminds me, was there a thing in the 80s of, like, black comedians, like, coming into franchises, like Richard Pryor, like, being in Superman 3? Well, I mean, I think there was a thing in the 80s where we had a lot of really good black comedians. And it was That's like, true. it was like, just plug them in, they'll figure it out. These guys, sure. these guys are improv machines. Um, but uh, <laughs> right. uh, but like with respect to uh, the 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 whale biologist. Oh, by the way, you, you see you hear how in this movie she's like, I'm. A, she literally says the phrase, "quote I'm a whale biologist." Yeah, that's where. So that's what they're making fun of in Futurama when they keep talking about whale biologist. Oh, I think because I, because okay. I, the thing I always wondered about Futurama was I was like, why don't they just say marine biologist or oceanographer? Uh-huh. I'm like, I was like, why are they very specifically using the phrase whale biologist? And then this lady says it in Star Trek Four, and I'm like, that's the that's like that dialogue really hits with a thud. I mean, unless in the 80s they were called whale biologists, like, I don't know, were they called whale biologists? I think if you say cetologist, no one really knows what you're talking about. Oh, so you just say Sequest whale biologist. hadn't come out yet, of course. <laughs> Amer- yeah. America hadn't fallen in love with our oceans. The 
Earth, Earth's final frontier, the oceans. Well, we mentioned the whales before. Uh, when the film was released, um, the environment, environmental groups, probably Greenpeace, complained uh, about the production being reckless and getting so close to humpback whales in the wild. What they didn't know, though, is that there are no humpback whales in this film, except for the stock footage that they use once or twice. Um, ILM, the special effects house that worked on the film, and the uh, robotics expert Walt Conti created four radio-controlled miniature models like underwater drones for the shooting of the underwater sequences. And they shot them all in like a pool somewhere, like a high school pool. And then they used scale models of like whale parts for like the underwater mind meld and the tail flip near the end of the film. So no whales at all were used. And it's so well done that you don't even think about it. I mean, I guess if you did, you'd be horrified, like leave these whales alone. But you just watch it and you go, yeah, that's a whale. That makes sense. That's the most ringing endorsement ever for these practical effects. Like these yeah, practical right. effects artists must have been like pinching themselves being like, we're so good. It made Greenpeace upset. Right. Yeah. Because they're, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're like, this, would, Greenpeace. <laughs> this would be impossible to replicate through special effects. They definitely, Leonard Nimoy definitely rubbed that whale's head. He must have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The way I liked it. He, he, he was into it. You could see. Of course he was into it. Like, um, yeah. that's, okay, that's, su that's super goddamn cool. Um, I, yeah, I like that. I liked a lot of the effects in this movie, period. Um, yeah. I love the stuff they did with the cloaked ramp. Yeah. Had yeah. we ever seen that before in a Star Trek movie? I don't think so. They talk yeah. about, you know, cloaking devices, and it's usually just camera trickery, or I think we might get a... In Star Trek Three, we get like a fade in, fade out uh, sort of effect. But yeah, like doing the practical uh, or, or just like the practicality of like it's invisible, but it crushes the ground. You know, like this, the trash can gets or people run into it. Or I like the part where um, Sulu's bringing the glass in and they're having to lower it into the invisible ship. You know, and Scotty's like, all right, a little farther. Yeah, I like stuff like that. Yeah, it was all really uh, like I don't think I've seen people interacting with a cloaked vessel like that in Star Trek. And I thought it was really interesting because like, well, yeah, it's hysterically funny, but it's also new and sci-fi. And then my favorite thing, it's also incredibly cheap. That is my favorite thing where they're like, our special effect is nothing. An actor miming. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's like our special effect is someone's going to pretend to run into a thing. Like, well, look, when you're getting Shatner and Nimoy, you got to save your money somewhere. And that's a pretty good place yeah. to save your money. And when the things happen, it's the 80s. So you got to have the character who is just, you know, doing his job or living his life and then sees it and is like, whoa, I got to get out of here. You got to have the trash, the uh, the trash men who are somehow from New York, even though they're in, uh, in, in California. Yes. I, hey, what's going on over there? We got to get out of here. The moment those trash men showed up, I was like, and the movie has begun. Just like, like, I, like, I'm like, I think I know what's about to happen with these trash men. I think they're going to literally say out loud, like, we didn't see nothing. <laughs> or like, we yeah, must right. be drunk. <laughs> like, one of these trash <laughs> yes. one of these trash men is going to throw a bottle of triple X strength liquor over Just his shoulder. Pour it out on the ground. Yeah. Pour it out on the ground. <laughs> say, I got to go back to therapy. And then one, and then also, and then the next day he's going to interact with a horse that he can hear talk, but no one else can. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then the next day he's going to encounter a frog that only dances and sings for him. <laughs> That's Warner Brothers. We can't do that. Oh, no, you're right. Exactly. Damn it. Although damn it. we've got the CW, though. The merging hmm, of Warner Brothers and Paramount. The CW. Hmm. We've covered a lot uh, about the film. I, you know, you mentioned before the punk on the bus. I wanted to just call out uh, that person, that actor, Kirk Thatcher, who was an associate producer on the film. And had read the script, uh, saw that character in that scene, which was inspired, I think, by um, a real uh, guy in a supermarket that Nimoy was annoyed by, and said um, to Nimoy, please let me play this role. I'm not really an actor, but I think I can do it. He shaved his hair into the mohawk hawk, and he bought the clothes, and he actually wrote the song that's playing as well and recorded it with uh, sound designer Mark Mangini of the film. So, like, he... He put himself into this thing. Now, that guy has gone on to, I think, act a little bit. He's actually like, um, he still produces, and he, he's a puppeteer. He does puppet work and stuff, cool. too. Um, but it, he just had to play that role. And he had to play it so well that they brought him back 
slight spoilers for season two of Star Trek Picard. He oh is in season God. two of Picard. Is he playing loud music from his iPhone? <laughs> he should be, but uh, not. maybe that's a little too updated. He's got a boombox still. Yeah, he he has a boom. Are you are you serious? He has a boombox. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where he got it from. I have no idea where he got maybe it. from. Maybe he's but, into yeah. old timey bullshit. I mean, some of those boomboxes sell for a lot of money on eBay. Here's the thing about <laughs> that yeah. song that that guy plays. And again, sci-fi nerds like to complain. That fake punk song is better than any of the than real of score. Songs. Well, than okay, a lot of punk score. songs, but also than the real <laughs> score of this movie. I'm listening to this fake punk song, and I'm like, I like this a lot. It's all right. <laughs> this, yeah, it kind of slaps. Slapped. Yeah. <laughs> It's pretty good. Uh, I don't know if he has. He must have a punk band or something. I mean, he could start the you know the bus punks or something like that after his appearance in the film. Oh my god! It's free yeah. advertising. I like yeah. I like that. I like that song. I like that scene. I liked the oh, Spock trying to curse and then and then Kirk being like, "You're doing it all wrong." And then Kirk trying to curse and right. also doing it <laughs> yeah. wrong. Yeah. Oh, there's so much. It's this is so. It's it's like the flip side of City on the Edge of Tomorrow or City on the Edge of Forever. Like, I'm sure this movie <laughs> equally infuriated Harlan Ellison, but this time, hopefully <laughs> yes. it also infuriated Gene Roddenberry. Hopefully no I, one was uh, happy. They, they, that's the one thing they agreed on. They probably didn't both like, uh, yeah, Star Trek four. Um, what, what's going on with Star Trek and whales? You know, we've got Moby Dick in uh, Star Trek two. We've got literal humpback whales in four. They go back to the Moby Dick well for first contact. There's actually whale crew members in lower decks, uh, why whales and Star Trek? It started before Star Trek Four. You know, man, you're raising a really good point. How does Star Trek want me to feel about whales? Because it's like well, apparently we we learned that they're sentient. Like, not only do they take them to the future, and they've got a whale uh, whale biologist to help uh, tell them everything they need to know, but we essentially establish that Spock can like talk to them telepathically. Like they are self aware. So. Do they need, like, is there going to be a, a whale delegate with Daft Punk and, and Cat Guy now on the Federation Council? Well, first off, if they're, if there's not, that's a crime and a tragedy. Like, yeah, we know how important these mistake. whales are. Like, we better <laughs> keep these whales happy so, so they don't, like, yeah. shut up the next time one of these probes shows up. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. We need these guys. <laughs> we need to keep these whales happy. But, like, all right. We need a lot of krill. <laughs> need, yeah. You keep these guys sitting pretty in krill. You keep their baleen <laughs> sparkling clean. Um, no, or here's what I want to say. It's like Star Trek II and then also Star Trek First Contact. Well, the, the coolest parts of those movies are when the captains are going after Moby Dick, which is a whale, and when they want to kill that whale. And like, yeah, in the end, they learn, like, you shouldn't kill the whale. But, like, that, those aren't the scenes we remember. We remember the scenes where he's like, God, I'm going to kill you. You're a whale. Like, or we're like, or we're like, Captain Picard, like, uses, like, Dixon Hill's gun to murder a bunch of little whales. Yeah. Like, those are the scenes we remember. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So just start... I, gotta see the, I need to see the fan edit now where we just put whales in for all those characters. Yeah, exa- yeah, where all the Borgs are whales. shooting whales on the holodeck. Shooting <laughs> whales on the holodeck. Every phase of Blast is a whale. Like, you know. So, okay. I'm just saying it's like, it seems like Star Trek's trying to, trying to eat both sides of the whale, if you know what I mean. Sometimes the <laughs> yeah, whale's sure. the villain. Sometimes the whale's the hero. Sometimes trying to kill the whale makes you the villain. I guess Star Trek in the end is more pro whale than anti whale. But wait, in Star Trek tardigrades, aren't those like little space whales because they can't die or something? Well, there is a gormagander in that episode that you yes, talked about there before. There is a space whale. Yeah, so they're they're really they're trying to have it both whales. They are trying to have it both whales, and then a bad guy hides in the whale. Remember in that episode with the gormagander. They use Starfleet regulations. Starfleet's like, we got to save the whales regulations are what left yeah, mud whales. on the sh- ship in the first place and and like makes mud kill all those people all those times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Star Trek's really conflict. Star Trek, pick a pick a when it comes to whales, pick a lane and stick to it. OK, figure this they got out bit by the whale. Yeah. You got 50 years to figure out how you feel about whales. Star Trek. <laughs> 
You know, the, the current Star Trek films, the Kelvin films, have borrowed liberally from the TOS films in their development. And now that we have a fourth Kelvin film on the way, do you think they might try to replicate some of that Voyage Home magic for a fourth film? They've already talked about uh, possibly having time travel in that film. If they don't make it funny, they will. there will not be a Kelvin 5. Like, we... It, it, it's just, it, like... We already have like the gritty. We uh, Kelvin two is gritty. That's got enough grit yeah. for like a whole all seven Kelvins. Wait, yeah. is Kelvin four like officially greenlit? Like, what can you tell me about the development of Kelvin four? It so it, it's been swirling for a while. They you know at Tarantino was on at one point. Uh, Noah Hawley was on at one point. They've commissioned scripts, but nothing official. And then a couple maybe like two months ago, I think um, they just said we're doing one, and all the cast was like. Oh, great. Um, you didn't tell us about it. So <laughs> it, administratively, administratively, they are committed to doing one. Where they're at, uh, we don't know. All right. Look, I'll complain about it, and then I'll go see it. Yeah, we'll, compl- yeah I'll, we'll be there to complain for I'll sure. I'll complain and complain and complain, <laughs> and then opening night. Like, that's the thing about nerds, which is why, like, you shouldn't cater to nerds. No matter what, we're going to see yeah. the movies. Like... Yeah. Like you like I think that's why the Marvel movies are so good because they are clearly it's like they have winks for nerds, they have like sure. Easter eggs for nerds and hints for nerds, but it's just a good guy punching a bad guy. It's like they those movies are real success. They should do what they should do what those Marvel movies does, where it's kinda clear that it's just Kevin Feige going, Hey, uh, turn this issue I like into a movie, okay? All right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll yeah. see it a little bit. Yeah. I want to see some yeah, scrolls, not... all right? Put some scrolls in yeah, this? Okay. Scrolls in there. I like the scrolls. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> uh, well, we've covered quite a bit. Uh, any last thoughts? Anything unspoken about Star Trek Four? Yeah, I, I definitely think, I definitely think it is the best Star Trek movie, um, because it's the Star Trek movie that you want to watch again and again. Like, yeah. you're not always going to want to watch the Wrath of Khan. Rathacon is great, but like you're not always going to want to see Spock like putting the needs of the many over the needs of the few or the one. Like, <laughs> right. you know, you're, you're like you're not always going to want to watch like them like going first star to the right and then straight on till morning and like seeing a bunch of like Klingon blood flying around in zero gravity. <laughs> like you're not always going to want to watch like the assassins being assassinated and all that. And but you're always going to want to watch Captain Kirk. Like trying to get with this whale biologist, and then in the end, like she turns him down in like a very cool way. Where I'm like, you know what? I'm kind of glad that this whale biologist is like, I can do better than you, especially she in the future. Away, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> have you seen some of the people in in this room? They look hideous. I'm like yeah. the hottest person in the future, and <laughs> I'll see you later, oldie. Like, I like that. Good for that whale biologist. What's going on with Catman? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to tug on that guy's Fu Manchu. Mm. Got a lot of choices here. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that will about do it, Asterios. Thanks for joining me to talk about this movie and about Star Trek and the Star Trek universe. If people want to continue the conversation, and they can at, at EIST Pod on Twitter and the Enterprising Individuals Facebook page, where can people find you online? Um, if you want to hear more of me being loud on a podcast, you listen to the loudest podcast. It's me and my rich fiance, <laughs> and, <laughs> and we uh, and we talk about just like uh, odd internet happenings. And for a long time, like every week, we would go on a different adventure. And with the pandemic open, uh, we recently went on our first adventure again. We went to Foxwoods Casino to the site of of where the villain from the Netflix documentary series, The Bad Vegan, lost millions of dollars. Oh um, okay. Previous <laughs> adventures include going to SantaCon and then going to the opposite of SantaCon, which is a sobriety party. Um, go- <laughs> going out, <laughs> going to, uh, we go to Joshua Tree's famed Integraton, which is a sound bath designed in the 1970s to communicate with Venusians. It's surprisingly affordable. And so you can, and as is the loudest podcast, it's free on all your podcasting platforms. And thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, it was great. And thanks again for joining me. We're signing off until the next mission. Hailing frequencies closed. Yeah. 
Backtracking is back for an all-new season. Hi, I'm Caliban. And I'm Gooey Fame. And we'd like to introduce you to Backtracking, the podcast that explores the real-world inspirations behind your favorite episodes of Star Trek. From historical events to classical literature to blockbuster films, we go where no pod has gone before to seek out the origins of classic Trek tales. Did you know, Gooey, that the TNG episode Too Short a Season was an allegory for the Iran-Contra affair? Yeah, only sweatier. Did you know that the Enterprise episode Regeneration was an homage to the John Carpenter film The Thing? Archer and T'Pol freezing to death over a bottle of whiskey would have been a controversial ending. As a dog lover, Archer would not like The Thing, I'm guessing. Oh my god, movie night is cancelled. Join us every other Thursday for a journey back to the beginnings of the Trek universe. Backtracking is available wherever you get your podcasts. No, Porthos! <laughs>